Hello everybody, my name is Andrew Norton and this is the panel on the Evolution Distributed Computing Project Beyond One. Uh, first of all, let me be upfront, I'm not a particle physicist. If you want description on the decay of you know, uh, time isons, you're a bit out of luck, unfortunately. Not what I do. Um, but we're going to talk on the Distributed Computing Project and the details behind it and why such projects are becoming more to the forefront of things. Um, if you wanted the particle physics stuff, sorry, this clashes with the International Particle uh, Physics Conference in Barcelona, and for some reason the climate in Barcelona is a little nicer for the project head. Um, I'm one of the lead beta testers, and I also do all the press and the public relations stuff for the Beyond One project. So, what is muon one uh, How does it work? And what's the difference between this and other distributed computing projects? Well, first of all, who's run a distributed computing project at home? Which one? SETI. SETI, SETI. No. Any others? Folding, folding. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Distributed computing is all about simultaneous processing. Here we see a traditional approach. You do one job, and then you go on to the next one, and the next one, and the next one. It's kind of slow, right? So then there's the distributed up computing idea. You take a job, you split it up into several simultaneous ones, and do it all at once. That's how supercomputers work. With hundreds, thousands of processes. Now, distributed computing takes this and spreads it out. Instead of it all being in one room, a big server, it's spread out across the internet. So we've got SETI at home.
It simulates in 0.01 nanosecond intervals. Now, at the speed of light, that's roughly three millimeters per particle, or about the thickness of a CD or DVD. And it, it measures its work in the particle time step. The amount of work to simulate one particle for one 0.01 nanosecond time step. A one billion particle time step simulation, which is about typical, is enough to simulate one particle from right here in this room to San Diego. Give you the kind of scale of the project we're looking at. Now, on uh, <coughs> June 10th this year, we reached the 25 quadrillion particle time step point. So, you know, we've done that many of that. So, uh, what is that? Billion is from here to San Diego. So, 25 million trips from here to San Diego, effectively, for a single particle, or enough to go from here to about five <coughs> times the distance of Voyager 1. Now, unlike most projects, Muon 1 is completely modular. A new design called a lattice, which is a design outline, um, builds each sub-simulation or design project from standardized components. And that allows us to move away from complexity. It moved at 300 billion a second, it took eight years to do 2% of 10 to the 21 permutations. Now imagine you're doing one simulation every 10 seconds instead of 300 billion every second. Now imagine there are, instead of 10 to the 21 permutations, there are 10 to the 300 permutations. And that's low volume. here. Some of the Muon 1 sub-projects have 10 to the 2,112 permutations. It's kind of hard to you know, imagine. This many <laughs> permutations. And yet using a mixture, mixture of random, evolutionary, and directed computation, this kind of data, search pattern, can be dealt with in about a year. There are some limitations though. When it's a binary search, it's either the item you're looking for, it's not. We have a needle in a haystack, it's either a needle, or it's the hay. You know, and the hay touching the needle is no, is no different than the piece of hay furthest away. So it can't deal with, a, it needs some kind of approximation data to know if you're close. And allows you to focus on areas that show promise. This means that some projects will only ever be brute forceful. So this is the basic structure difference. On the left we've got a brute force structure. You get work in the central generating system, you crunch it, you send it back. The data is then cl collated centrally, and you know, there the data is on. Set it home. They started in what, 98, 99? As of 2007, they were only just starting to centrally collate their data. So that's the kind of, you know, bottleneck. With the Muon 1 structure on the right here, we start with the generator, which is your own client on your own computer. It generates its own work because there's this huge workspace to start with. And then it crunches that, and then sends a copy to the central server, but keeps a copy. And then it uses its own copy of data past done to generate new work in an evolutionary manner. And it can also then, if you want, pull the data of the best results for the whole project and keep that onto it as well, and integrate that in with your own designs. So every single client has its own unique mixture of central best ones and your own past results to mix in and give a good um, a good base to get a great design. So what's the point of the project? Well, it's to find neutrinos. Neutrinos don't really interact with anything. Right now, there are six million neutrinos passing through each and every one of you every single second. Almost all of them are coming from the sun. Now, because they don't interact, they're very hard to detect. So one of the things 
we're trying to do is increase the number of particles in a given area from 6 million meters squared to 25 billion. And the hope is that we can find its mass and some other quantum parameters via what's called quantum oscillation. So, if we aim to uh, find it via a quantum oscillation, it's the wavelength changes in inverse proportion to the mass, minutely. Now the wavelength for this is about 5,000 kilometers. So there's a bit of a problem using solar neutrinos. Any ideas what it is? No, the sun's so big. You don't know where exactly in the sun's core, which is um, about 3,500, uh, 350,000 kilometers wide. So, you know, that's what, uh, 70 wavelengths worth just in, in the sun's core itself. You don't know where exactly it's coming from, so you can't get an accurate measurement. So, we've got these billions of neutrinos, so we need a fixed distance. Now, the emitter will be near Oxford in England, which is where the project's based at the Rutherford Appleton Labs. All in all, there'll be three detectors for the project. One will be on site. One will be a medium range detector, about 1,500 kilometers, that'll be somewhere around Italy. And the other one will be about between 4,000 and 7,000 kilometers. And here in this illustration, we've got it targeted at Japan. So actually firing it through the Earth from England to Japan. Uh, such as the uh, Hypo, Hypo Kamiokandi neutrino detector in Japan. So why should we bother? <laughs> Progress. We also need to know that neutrinos can potentially be as big of a deal as the Higgs boson. And we've all heard of the Higgs boson, right? Well, you know, the LHC is you know, the Large Hadron Collider, they make a big deal about it in CERN, you know. As though it's the only thing we need to know left. It's not. But the third reason is there are potentially limitless uses for the neutrino. It's actually useful, a rarity in much of <laughs> theoretical science these days. <laughs> so what potential benefits could there be for particles which don't often interact and have actually been described as a bullet going through fog? Well, are there any other things we know that can go through ions without harm or effect? Radio. 150 years ago, we didn't really know of the existence of radio waves. Things emitted them, stars and all that sort of thing, but we couldn't detect them because we didn't know they existed and we didn't know how to detect them. So, until the late 19th century, when we built detectors for them, we knew nothing of them. They couldn't be used, they were of no use to us. This means we could actually use point to point um, neutron transmitters instead instead of bouncing it satellite to satellite. I mean, have you ever seen a satellite lag on TV? I did one for about four years ago for G4 from here to uh, San Francisco and it was about a three second lag. Very hard to think with. We also mentioned SETI at home earlier, so we've done it. SETI project listens from, from space. What about a new direction for SETI? If we can send out radio waves, why can't alien civilizations send out neutrinos? That way they're not um, interfered, interfered with by things like nebulae and star and gravitational pulling. So it's less of a distortion, less and potentially more of a chance for finding alien civilizations. There are other elements of the factory though, of the whole project, that have boons for science. The early part of it contains a proton beam. This can be used for experiments such as dealing with nuclear waste, called proton transmutation. With the Fukushima incident earlier this year, it's become a whole lot more important than it was. It can also be used to generate a high intensity neutron source for 3D atomic microscopy. And then later on, it can be used as the basis of a muon collider which provide high energy 
impacts very much higher than even the Large Hadron Collider. So, what is it? This is the overall design of the factory, as envisaged. <coughs> it's got the top left, up here. Okay. It starts at the top left here, with a uh, H minus source. It then passes through a number of guides, and through a drift tube system, and a radio frequency quadrupole into this system here where it strips the uh, hydrogen anions into a, the proton beam. These stacked synchrotrons are the proton beam itself. And then at this point, it comes through here, a uh, pulse power about, uh, well, says here, one nanosecond duration for about five megawatts average and a 16 terawatt pulse speed. And it comes to this area, which is the, um, Right now, this boxed area is the new is the new on one project, and it uh, strikes a target. The program means strikes a target, which is a 20 centimeter long tantalum rod. Not an element you hear of every day, tantalum. But uh, when it hits this rod, it produces pions, and these pions eventually decay into muons. And then, after having the energy levels corrected to a, a, a level we want, it's then dumped into this cooling ring. You can see over the bottom right. Then, when it's time to produce the beam, it's accelerated out with a linear accelerator, and then some more accelerators up to 50 GeV, and then fired into the three detectors into the, in the decay ring, which is where the muons decay into neutrinos. So, this is the system that muon one is working on right now. Over the last eight years, there have been 42 separate design theories or lattices on how to build this. And some of the results have been very encouraging. There's been over a, a more than double the yield from traditional design methods. So it's been, you know, it works. But there's also a lot of research still going on in this area. For example, the tantalum rod at the top. What if we replaced it with titanium? That's another one of the targets under investigation. If it's titanium, how would the particles go? Would the particles emitted by the rod still need the same magnets still work to focus them just right? Like, you know, what needs changing? And other parts of the project are still under um, investigation too. Uh, the proton beam hitting it until 2005 was going to be a 2.2 GeV proton beam. In the summer of 2005, they decided that 10 GeV one might be more efficient. So instead of throwing out all the work and spending months and months recalculating everything, they needed a simple change to the, to the front end of the program, and off it went again. Within within three weeks of it, the idea being formed, we were already getting sizable results. So it can give a very fast turnaround. So this is what the client looks like in actuality. In the center, that white bar, is the tantalum rod. And this is the initial solenoid. This orange section is like a backstop to eliminate particles that go the wrong way, which is going to happen, but it saves us calculating it. And the color indicates their energy level, red being the highest, down to blue and green. And on the right there is the first focusing solenoid. So this is the entire decay channel as one of our early experiments from 2003. This is called the solenoids only uh, design. And this is at the midpoint in the simulation. What we can see is here in the middle, we have the active particles. And you can see they're spread out by energy level. This is at about, uh, probably about 40 nanoseconds in. And over here, we have uh, shown the impacted particles. That's ones that have hit the boundaries of the design, so we can actually see in real time where there are any bottlenecks, and that allows us to do the directed design. Um, in late 2003, this end target here on the right was replaced by uh, the next phase, which was energy sorting and focusing, such as this chicane. 
This is the first system test. Um, does everybody know what a mass spectrometer is? Well, not many people, but it's a system you atomize and then ionize a substance and then fire it, and a magnetic field bends it around a curve. And as you change the field strength, the different masses of the particle bend different amounts. You use that to work out the masses of the different particles and therefore its composition. This is more of a, an energy spectrometer. And only the correct amount of energy will actually make it all the way through the gates. And as you can see, this is where it looks like in practice. And as we can see, here are the number of particles active, right here. And this is starting at about the 110 nanosecond point, and it'll go to about 170 nanoseconds. Um, this is actually the client in, in action. This is what the visual mode looks like. And it will automatically adjust the frame rate to keep it going optimally. And this is what it actually runs at, the speed it actually runs at on this laptop. So as you can see, all the reds have been eliminated, most of the greens have been. And so by the end, we've only got a touch of orange, but mostly the yellow particles that we really wanted. It's kind of wasteful though. As you see, we started with like 33,000, we're now left with 4,400. So we needed a different way, which sped up the greens and slowed down the reds, so to speak. Because what we ended up with was, this is our energy system. We could have all of these at the top, if you're too fast. And we could have all the ones at the bottom that were too slow, and we just left this narrow band. Or we want that. So we use a system called phase rotation. This is what it looks like. Again, this is from the client. These rings, they're changing orange and blue. They're the sequence, and they're, what they're doing is they speed up the greens, they push the greens along faster, they slow down the reds, and the yellows, in theory, should go through at the exact same frequency rate with the things so that they're not changed at all. So when you put these components together, this is what they look like. This top one is, um, as the last is called, chicane Lanac B. Named because you've got a chicane system and a Lanac, and it was the second one. This bottom one is uh, phase rotation B. Again, you have the decay channel, there it is here. But the phase rotation system you've just seen. And this one's taken at the end of the simulation. There's this one, you can see all the particles right here. Now, so this is what the results look like. This is, again, from the client I've run on this computer for about three months. We have results for one lattice over time. And as you can see, it evolves, and the yields get steadily better. We have the cumulative average in green, the 100 results average in this bright yellow, and then the 1,000 result average in this tan line. As you can see, it, it generally increases over time, so the yields get better. I should point out, I run this without using the best results method. This is only what my client itself on my computer running solo generates. So if we look, zoom in, we can see that uh, the different types of evolution <coughs> that are incorporated are actually marked in the top line down here. I'm not zoomed in. You can see that in this, for this lattice, it seems that mu1 is the best method for growing the results we want. Although crossover is pretty good and so is interpolate. So, we can look at the results overall as well. This is the results overall for um, Lattice that was released in last year. This is a three month period. And it shows the work units done on the top axis and the actual yield overall. And the color is the intensity of the yield of the results. So the more results in that area, the brighter the color. So as you can see, over time, we've got the bigger, longer design, more particles in them, giving a better yield. As I said, this is a three month period I don't know if you can see down here, but it gives the counted results. And uh, that's 
40,000. And that was December uh, last year. And I'm going to about 350,000 results. It takes a few moments, but you can see just how much it's grown from down here. And a line that finds certain hot areas and then a new best design comes along and moves it on again and everybody else follows it, chases it, and works towards a better one. That was all in a three month period. With, and to be honest, Mule One isn't that popular of a project, surprisingly enough. It doesn't use the point with the virtually open integrated computer, whatever network computing is. But it can. So in the future, we're looking at, this is one of the things for the next stage, the cooling ring system. This is one of the proposed designs uh, as of 2005, but it doesn't actually work out that well in, in practice. There are other designs like a dog bone style or an elongated figure eight. But this is the sort of the thing we're looking at for the next stage. So we've got the existing client. You can see there's the phase rotation system there. You inject them and cool them down and store them at the right energy. Um, but we can also do the front part of the system as well. And this is the start of the system, as I said. And this is the simulation using the exact same client of the radio frequency quadrupole. And here are the protons and the uh, pitch minus ion sources. So, how do you participate in it? Well, you need to use the native client. With three options running, you can either run it in the background, completely hidden, as a command line, or in the graphical mode we've just that we've taken the videos from. Um, if you if you already use the um, BOINC, BOINC client, the Boink client for SETI at home, there's a wrapper through the YoYo at home project. It's not quite as um, efficient. Uh, it only runs single core. So it runs on a quad core like this, it will run four separate instances. Um, so the other problem is, because there's only basically two of us working on the project, uh, the main physicist is also the coder, it's Windows only. <laughs> Sorry, but that's what it was. <laughs> it now does run under Wine, though. But we say funding limitations and time limitations. Because the project head is also working for that so well. So, any questions?